Good morning, one million cups. Okay, that was decent. We can try it again. Good morning, one million cups. Good morning. Much better. Thank you all for being here. Hope everybody's Wednesday is off to a great start. Uh, we're gonna get started here. We're gonna have two presentations, um, each six minutes in length. Uh, we're gonna have our expert panel ask questions first, and then after, you all get your chance to ask questions too. So when we come around with a microphone, please raise your hand uh, and you get to ask questions. Um, so let's introduce our expert panel first. If you guys would like to uh, tell us your name and uh, just your intro. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Kelly. I'm the CEO of the Marketing Advisors Group. Uh, what we do is help companies grow their business from the back office. So focusing on strategy, the processes, operations, and technology. Excited to be here today. You have some fans. Hey, yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Jimmy Perlick. I am in business development for a marketing uh, agency called Lily and James Creative. We're a Kansas City-based marketing uh, firm. Uh, we do it all. Uh, we probably lead with social media as our specialty, but we um, do a great job with videography, uh, web design, graphic design, content writing. We work with small to mid-sized businesses to help them grow and drive traffic to their websites and through their front doors. Thanks. Thanks for being here. You may have noticed there's a few reserved seats over here. Uh, if everybody would please give a big round of applause to the Kaufman interns for the summer. Everybody welcome, thank you for being here. I don't think they realized we were gonna intro them. Um, also, uh, please download the One Million Cups app, check in. Uh, you'll also be able to click on the companies and provide feedback, and that's the biggest part of why we're here is to uh, help these businesses, provide them feedback, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, we also have our caffeinators. If you could raise your hand, stand up, please let them know who you are. These are basically the extension of the organizers. Uh, we like to call them your best friends, so if you have any questions about One Million Cups, uh, anything like that, please uh, let them know and they'll be happy to talk to you. So we're gonna get started with our presentation. Uh, so please welcome uh, Josh and Mari from Accelerate Tech Learning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joshua Clark. This I'm is Mari Trent. This is Mari, and we are Accelerate Tech Learning. Uh, we provide an accelerated path to a career in IT uh, for Kansas City residents. Uh, of course, we offer these services to pretty much everyone in the Kansas City area. However, we have a really big focus on the urban core, as well as minorities, veterans, and people trying to re-enter uh, the workforce. Uh, myself, I'm an IT consultant in the daytime. I have about 17 years uh, working with companies as small as Swope Health Services to as large as Garmin, uh, assisting them with their IT infrastructure and software. That's my background. Mari has a massive background in uh, higher education and administration, working with non-profits. Uh, professor Bob over there is our lead professor, uh, and he pretty much handles our curriculum and our manages our team. I didn't think I would be nervous when I got up here. However, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, me too. Yeah, so this kind of all started a couple, a year, over a year ago. Uh, I used to do an event for a lot of my clients called Tech Talk KC, and pretty much it was a lot of senior leadership. We get together once a month uh, at, at, Google, at the Google Fiber Space and pretty much just talk about the needs uh, that they might need, whatever it need. The one thing that was reoccurring was just software engineers, software developers, uh, IT security. Uh, what ended up happening is a lot of my friends found out about this event. A lot of other people found out about this event that, you know, hiring managers and whatnot would be at, and so they started attending the event as well. Uh, and so what came from that is we started to identify really what the needs were. Not necessarily, of course, there's a million, you know, software developer boot camps and all that other stuff, uh, but we really built ours around the needs of Kansas City today as well as to meet the needs of them in the future. Uh, we also incorporate a massive networking piece. Uh, I make sure that I bring in my IT contacts that I uh, assume uh, have amassed over you know, 17 years on a monthly basis uh, to meet with our students. Uh, as soon as our students start to learn a skill, uh, they start to apply them in the real world. As soon as they learn how to build a website, they start to build websites for small to medium-sized businesses in the Kansas City area. Uh, as we all know, one of the things that anyone that attends a boot camp has to overcome is you don't have any experience. And so what we try to do is we try to make sure that every step of the way that they engage with one of our 28 partners 
to do real world, real world work. So when they go and apply for that first interview, they just don't have uh, project work that they did in the classroom. They're able to leverage real things. We try to really bring a real entrepreneurial spirit uh, to our classroom. I try to tell these guys every single day, you know, uh, here are the areas that you can go into. Once you start to learn how to build a website, uh, one of my, uh, one of our students, DeAndre, his friend is the owner of uh, LC's Barbecue. They needed a website. I told him, start engaging with those people. Start reaching out. You don't necessarily have to go and work and be uh, a software engineer. You can go somewhere and you can work have your own business. Uh, another focus of us is just really just making sure that we focus on that urban core and that we really just uh, address the issue of diversity. You know, uh, one thing I love about IT is that uh, they are really inclusive. They don't care. White, black, Chinese, candy stripe. If you can do the work, they want you to come work for them. And so what we're trying to do every single day uh, is make sure that we provide these guys the skills. Uh, we hurdles and stuff that we've overcome is really just trying to overcome the barriers that exist that prevent uh, the urban core and minorities and veterans and everything else from getting access to quality education. Uh, you know, things cost money. You know, uh, if you're a 45-year-old man like James, who's been driving a forklift your whole life, you might not have the money to, uh, you might not have good credits, you might not have this, you might have had that. So if you go to somewhere else, they might say, oh, you can't get a Pell Grant, you can't do this. Uh, pretty much that's what we do. I have conversations with people every single day. If you want this education, what is preventing you from getting the education? Is it childcare? Is it this, if it that? And just remove those barriers to just make sure that uh, people can get the education that they want, that they need, and that they deserve. Any questions? Oh, wait. One thing that you guys could do for me, if you have a website that you need built, a mobile app, if you need anything software developer-wise, a project, reach out to me. Uh, let me have one of our students assist you uh, so we can help build their resume and make them more employed after they exit our program. And Lisa's over there. She handles our curriculum, too. She's one of the co-founders. She just walked in. Right. That went really fast. I've got a minute. <laughs> now All I've right. got a minute. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the driving force behind it. So. Uh, if anyone is familiar with uh, WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, President Obama signed this into law um, in 2014, and it is supposed to give access uh, to education and training um, to the underserved communities, so underemployed, unemployed uh, people in the community. They did this, and they put $10 billion behind it, uh, and said that it would affect 20 million Americans. Uh, so we jumped on board with that, and uh, we are WIOA approved. We are um, approved by the Missouri Department of Higher Education. We jumped on that and uh, just to help, just to be another entity in Kansas City to help further that goal and that movement and that initiative. And that is the time that we have. We will. <laughs> We're going to open it up for questions. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Expert panel, take it away. Boy, there is a three second delay. You were right. Um, great presentation, guys. Uh, thank you for being here. I guess uh, one of the questions I had was um, you know, obviously, lots of obstacles. I'm, you know, you mentioned financial, finances being an obstacle. Uh, what are the other, I guess, obstacles that might uh, you guys might run across, and how do you deal with those? And then, do you have any kind of, um, is there any kind of career placement or maybe internship program? How are you, how do you integrate these students once they go through your program and get them into careers? Yeah, so one of the things that we do to make, uh, regarding job placement, I kind of touched on that we have monthly guest speakers come in. Uh, and so what I do is that I have my IT contacts, they're pretty much hiring managers. I have them come in and speak on a monthly basis. And what I do is we use Slack. And so I upload the, uh, before they come, I upload their LinkedIn profile. Uh, I let the students know to engage, what questions to ask, uh, build that, you know, build that relationship. Because this is someone that you might be potentially uh, be submitting a resume to. Uh, as recently as our last one, someone that actually didn't attend our boot camp, uh, but we do kind of a networking thing. He actually was offered a job uh, right there on the spot, you know, uh, 
from that. So that's one thing that we do. So we do resume building, we do LinkedIn, we do training. We have about 28 different companies that we work with to offer uh, internships uh, and job placement and everything else. And just to speak a little bit about uh, funding as an issue. So traditionally, a lot of uh, the boot camps or uh, the career training schools, you, they have a ticket price, right? And if you are someone who comes in and you can't meet that ticket price, so you can't, you don't have access to funds, you don't have good credit, so you can't get a loan, uh, right? You don't have a Pell Grant, you don't, you know, you don't qualify for these things. We have an in-house financing model. So students can come to us eager to learn, able to learn, and we work with them no matter what financial situation that they're in. Because we believe in our program and we believe in our students. So when our students do get internships and get jobs, you know, they can pay then. Um, so we, we really try to meet them at wherever they are with funding. We've also partnered with uh, the Community Capital Fund. Uh, so we are going and raising money to get scholarships for students. Um, because a lot of our students are low income, uh, either unemployed or underemployed. Awesome. Well, you, you took my first question, so thank you for that. Um, uh, first of all, I love the mission. I think what you guys are doing, you're filling a big need, uh, and I do agree with you. I think that there is opportunity there, for, especially for the folks you're focusing on. Um, so, our, quick, quick question, are you guys for profit or are you not for profit? So we are not non-for-profit. We are technically for-profit, um, but we have a non-profit mission, and so that's why we were able to partner with the Community Capital Fund. And we're seriously consider, considering um, going the non-profit non route. route. You know, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, since talking turkey, you know, I mean, uh, our first class that we took, you know, none of the students were in the class uh, for almost three months, and then they were like, Dom. You know, it's not the best business model. However, uh, it's helping think, people. Know, I yeah, I, I didn't. I, I don't think that we. I don't. I've been in IT for 17 years, um, and just to be perfectly honest, I do this a lot. Uh, and I'm from the inner city of Kansas City, uh, and IT has allowed me to take my family uh, out of the inner city and everything else to provide for them. And a lot of my friends look at me and they have no idea what I do. And even when I tell them what I do, they think it's like something crazy that they can never do. You know, but. I really know that IT is, if you know how to turn on a computer, you can do it, you can code Attainable. and everything else. And so that's what we're trying to do, just trying to get as many people, you know, it's not, uh, I'll spend my money and everything else and, and we'll, what we gotta do just to make sure that people get access to the education that they need. So. Yeah, for sure. So as you think about building out your brand and you think about, um, uh, getting your name out there and that, that, that construction across all the different channels where you can have that brand. Where do you where do you focus? How do you how do you bring people into the program and and how do you how do you do that? So uh, branding is really that's a really great question. Branding is really important. So we're actually you know we are a startup so we are new um, and we are still in conversations you know about our brand and what we want our brand to be. Um, but how we get our message out is uh, basically through social media platforms. So Facebook is a really uh, big tool. Also, uh, Black Privilege, they have a huge following. And um, we've done several events with them and um, promotional videos and things like that with them uh, to get our, our word out to, to the community. You know, I, and I had a chance to uh, look at some of your different uh, channels uh, getting ready for this. And I would tell you, uh, know your audience in those channels. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of advice to you. Know your audience, um, commit to those, and, and commit the content to that audience. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't shortchange yourself. Don't, the reason I bring that up is I think on one of the channels, it was uh, Twitter, I think. Your Twitter channel is really just cross posts of, of Instagram, right? Right. That's what, and so, that you pick up on that immediately because that's all I saw, right? No, so, yeah, it's so true because I think about that every time. Yeah. I, I think about that actively. Yeah. So know your audience there, right? I mean, if your audience, um, don't cross post Instagram there if your audience isn't looking for that. They can go to Instagram to find that, right? right. So just, just kind of lock in on that and be committed to that. Thank you for that. Uh, what is the, so what is the time commitment of, uh, you know, your students and your program, you know, once they come in, 
Um, you know, so, you, you've get, you've gotten them; they're engaged. How do you? What's the time frame, and how do you keep them engaged once they get in? I mean, how do they decide? Okay, so this is for me. This isn't for me. We do that a number of ways. So one thing we like to do to keep them engaged is by doing the buddy system. So uh, if anyone is military, our professor, Bob, he is a veteran, he's ex-military. And um, so we like to call it um, battle buddies, right? So when you go into the military, you get assigned a person and that is your battle buddy. So that is the person who holds you accountable, that is the person that you lean on, um, you know, do projects with and things like that. So that's one thing that we do to keep them engaged. Uh, the second thing that we do is we are there and we're present. Um, so we, after our first week of class, we sent out a survey to our students. And one of the things that they wanted was more FaceTime with uh, the founders. And so we committed to doing that. So we go in, we make sure that we're talking to them, you know, about their life, like how are things, and, you know, just being really personable with them. And we found that uh, that really keeps them engaged. Um, and, then in, and, and then Bob as well. Uh, Bob is our professor, and one thing about Bob is that Bob is able to connect with them, uh, and I'm able to connect with them and get open and honest feedback. I think, um, you know, one of one of my one of one of my really you know affections is for James. You know, so James is 45 years old. He's drove a forklift his entire life, and like he's just excelling at this. And so I'm in constant conversation with him, uh, having him share his story uh, with the other students and everything else. It was just about that constant conversation and just staying engaged and bringing in those guest speakers and letting them know that after you come out of this, you do have options and just letting them know that. Uh, and uh, you mentioned time commitment. So right now we offer a six month and a 12 month program. Um, so the six month program is Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, and then we have our evening class, which is Monday through Friday from six to 10. Um, and so, Six months to a year is what we found is a, is a good time frame, especially for a full stack boot camp. Um, a lot of places are doing 12 weeks and under. We just don't feel that you can really retain all of that information and really hone in on your skills in that short of a time frame. So ours is a little bit longer than some of the other programs, um, but we think that that you know, will work for our students. Um, also, we have an online piece. So we were we uh, talked about overcoming obstacles. One of the obstacles that a lot of people face is time, right? Because a lot of students are working while they're going to school, they have families, they have all of these other things going on. So, you know, we do an online piece so that they're able to, you know, do some of their learning at home and then making sure that they get those contact hours in the classroom. Bob is really great. Uh, you know, some students are like, hey, I can't make it. Can we, uh, can I come in on a Saturday? And Bob is awesome. He comes in on Saturdays, works with them. Really, you know, we, we just try to overcome all of those obstacles um, for our students. All right, we are going to go ahead and turn it over to audience questions. We're going to kick it off here on your left. Hi, thanks for coming out this morning. Uh, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I want to offer a suggestion. Um, one of our expert panelists uh, asked a question that I was thinking of asking you. Uh, were you profit or non-profit? I, I got the idea when you started talking about it that you're working for inner city people who want a career change or a new career or and, and helping them. And so you've got a cause. I, I would state that cause right out of the box from the, the minute you start your presentation. So people aren't confused whether you're profit or nonprofit. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question down front. Hi, my name's Deborah. Good morning. My question is for the people that are employed and they're not at the level they want to be, have you tried working with companies for educational assistance? If they work at ABC Company and they have a program that they help 
for you know pain education? Has that been an yeah, avenue? Uh, uh, typically, a lot of our uh, students, like we have one that works in St. Luke's and some other people that offer uh, tuition assistance. Uh, we're working with the guy right now. Uh, he's on the hardware side of things, and he kind of identified a software uh, engineering job that, that's posted that he wants to pursue. And so he reached out to us to see if he can get the training. Uh, and one of the conversations we have is like, where do you work? What are you doing? Uh, do they offer tuition assistance? And in, in, in it, that really just depends on the company as well, right? Um, so some companies, they only offer tuition assistance for degree programs. We're not a degree program, but we are a certificate program, and our certificate is recognized by the Missouri Department of Higher Education. Question for you. Um, what do the students get when they leave? Are they getting a certification, and then do companies recognize the accreditation of whatever they're getting? Yes, my experience has been, and you know, it depends on who you ask, right? So uh, when Glenn Carney, who was in, he, you know, uh, you know the students um, constantly, that's one of the questions that's always asked for people in IT, is, a, is the certificate that you get uh, upon completing our course, or any six or 12 month boot camp, uh, as much, is it as heavy weighted as a four year degree in computer? science or whatnot, uh, what, what has really been, you know, back in the day, people would say no. Uh, but when we asked a question to uh, Glenn Carney the other day, he would say, I will go to college for the experience, uh, but as far as the education and everything else, the boot camp and that certification that we provide, coupled with the real world experience and actually working with companies uh, and doing real work as you go through our program, just, just not doing dummy projects, doing our program, uh, that really, you know, Set the bar and make you more employable versus someone that went to college for four years and came out with a science degree and has really never done any work in the real world. But I would still go to college because it's fun. Question up front. Uh, thank you for a great presentation and a, and a great idea. <clears throat> I'm curious about your business model in terms of are you serving hundreds of students or thousands of students and do you have paid staff, you know, and uh, Where's your physical location? Do you have a school or an office building or? So we are, so we are small. Um, we are small right now. We have a class of around eight. Um, well, two classes, one of them has like five, one of them has like three. Um, and we are in PlexPod, actually. We do uh, co-working uh, in the PlexPod uh, commons right here in Westport. Um, we are small. We like to keep our class sizes small for a couple reasons. Uh, one, the students get one-on-one -on -one time, like more one-on-one -on -one time uh, with the instructor. So I don't know if anyone is sending their kids to school these days, but you know, I've got a seven-year-old, so I'm sending her to school. One thing that I do look for are small class sizes because I want Mackenzie to be able to have access to her teacher uh, you know, and not have to wait for 20 other kids. Uh, so we do uh, small class sizes. We find that it's more intimate. Um, it's less intimidating, especially for adults re-entering education, right? Because they're like, oh, I'm an adult. I haven't been to school in a long time. So it's intimidating. So uh, we do small class sizes for those reasons. So if, <clears throat> if, if I'd like to sign my son up, for example, for one of your classes, I mean, maybe a six-month class, is. Are we talking hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars or one what ballpark? One million. <laughs> one million. million. Okay. One million. You're on. One, uh, so the price of our the price of our course is eighteen thousand seven hundred and eighty-eight. Uh, any Kansas City resident uh, automatically qualifies for a four thousand dollars scholarship uh, via the uh, No No we, No Joey Foundation, uh, and then uh, the other bulk of that money we have, like I mentioned, internal finance and external finance. And we are campaigning for scholarships. Yeah, so if you um, want to bring your son down, come sit him on down and have a meet with so him. Place, right? That price is for six months or a year? or for uh, Six months or 12 months price is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got a question for you in your back, or in the back on your right. <laughs> I'm just curious um, what your job placement rate is. So the, I guess the first part of that question would be how many students have graduated from your program, and then how many of them are working full-time as uh, but software to, I kind of look at that question two different ways. So via Tech Talk KC, which, uh, this, well, which this came from, job uh, placement rate on that was probably 
far as job placement for this boot camp, we haven't finished our first class. However, I'll double back and say I have placed two uh, students in job via, via our networking platform that attended another local boot camp. Question in the middle. Good morning. Good Hi. Morning. Do you take on uh, nonprofits to as your case studies or to yes. help out? I would. Well, I, maybe I talk fast a lot of times, but if any, uh, so I'll retouch on that. So pretty much, we love to engage with non-for-profits and or small to medium-sized businesses. So if you are not for profit or anything like that, you need website help, uh, you want to look at having an app built, uh, any number of things, please reach out to us and you know use our students uh, to do that. So, yeah. No, it is free of charge. Maybe I should have said that, at no cost. Got another question for you in the back. I saw a headline in the past six months or so that said there are like 3,000 unfilled tech jobs in Kansas City. Is this a report that you're intimately familiar with? Yes, it is. In, we're intimately familiar with that, and that is pretty much why, uh, for me, you know, there's a large company here in Kansas City that pretty much takes all the IT talent. There's two of them. Uh, and so there is a massive need for IT talent, especially in the software developer, software engineering space, because one of these clients pretty much takes everyone. Uh, and so that is something that really, uh, really was a driver behind us and something I'm intimate with, especially about not only people that are re-entering the workforce, uh, but you know, older individuals that are in IT that just are on the hard hardware side of things, and typically the hardware is typically going away, and they can come back and get re-educated on the software side of things. And we have hundreds of software as a service startups here in the county. And then my follow-up question, um, can you tell me how you are preparing folks for the right jobs within that 3,000 number? So if you're taking people who have no tech background and you want to get them a tech background and a job, convince me you're training them for the right jobs inside of that number. So that's really good. So what we, what we uh, offer is a full stack uh, development, uh, full stack development course. So what that means, stack refers to layers. Uh, so uh, development is pretty much, uh, I'm sorry, development is usually split up into two sides. So there's the front end and there's the back end. Uh, you can do multiple jobs within those two uh, sections. So we are teaching from beginning to end, full stack. So it opens up jobs, not just, um, you know, I can build websites, but you can also do uh, the database side. You can do uh, server engineering. Um, there's so many different uh, job opportunities, job career paths that you can get out of having our full stack development course. And, then, and the second piece and the first piece really to that is how we identified that we wanted to do a full stack developer course versus a web developer course or just focusing on front end or back end. It's just by having conversations with the, with the companies here in Kansas City. So at those talk tech events, when I do meet with my clients and everything else, uh, part of our, one of our 28 partners or one of the uh, software as a service companies that we work with, we're asking them what are the areas that you need addressed. And so that's what we build our platform on. And then when you talk about the right jobs, they come in and they're, they're a full stack developer and they can do everything. Jack of all trades, master of nothing. They work with Bob to kind of identify what area are they really good at? Are they really good at job and everything else? And then what I do is I pair them up with people that are currently working in the industry to make sure that, hey, this is what this job looks like. This is what the day to day is and everything else that that's the, the route that they want to go. You know, it's several different routes. They can come out and be a solutions architect. They can be a consultant. They can just be websites. They can be entrepreneurs. So many different things they can do, so. Question in the front. Um, okay, I know you talked a little bit about helping other nonprofits, but um, as far as like taking your students and outsourcing them to help other nonprofits and expand, because like let's say we have a camp and we're teaching kids, and we need somebody to come in and kind of show how a web developer develops a website. Mm -hmm. And would you guys come in? And we, that's awesome. Well, that's absolutely awesome and so on target because we actually offer a free uh, coding session, coding sessions all through the summer for kids ages 10 to 17, um, and you know, and we're teaching them basic coding. So yeah, we absolutely will come in. Um, Lisa here 
uh, where's so you stuff? do travel. It's not something oh, yeah, where yeah, they would yeah, have to yeah, come we, to would, you. We, we would we would love to do that. Yeah. yeah okay. It's not something that we do. We're currently doing it at our campus. But to piggyback on that, yes, that is definitely. <laughs> All right, guys, last question. Last question. What can we as a community do to help you? Uh, what you guys can do is uh, kind of like some of the conversations that we had. If you're thinking about uh, doing a coding for kids and you're looking for resources, reach out to us. Uh, if you need a website or something like that, reach out to us because that right there and that real world experience will uh, make a difference uh, for the people exiting our program. Uh, when their resume gets in front of a hiring manager or when they go and do that. The website that they did with you, the coding work that they did with you, the project work that they did with you. So that would be our ask. And just engage us for pretty much anything. Uh, I'd love to meet people and do all that good stuff. So, Big round of applause, guys. Thank you. All right, got a couple quick announcements. Up first, I've got Mark Kelly. Oh, you got Trump. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, wanted to personally invite you uh, tomorrow night to the first ever LinkedIn Local KC event. Any of you familiar have seen any of the advertisements for LinkedIn Local KC? Yes, good. All right, so uh, this is the first ever. It's being held, they hold them in about 100 different cities across the country. We have four kind of pillars that we're focusing on. We're focusing on the connections, which makes sense, collaboration between all of us, the cultivation of those relationships, and then the community. So tickets cost $10. It helps us cover our variable cost of hosting the event. It does come with a drink ticket, so we, we give that to you. Um, but then anything that's over and above what uh, our costs are, we donate to a charity. This charity this year, or this, this particular event, is the Boys and Girls Club of Kansas City. So uh, there'll be a lot of people there. If you've ever wanted to learn about your second degree connections, this might be a great venue for that. Uh, the reason I'm involved is because everyone I've met associated with it so far, and actually most of the people who registered, are people I don't know. And so it's great from a networking standpoint to get to expand that range. So, if you have any questions, I'll be here uh, after the event, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Up next, we have Kyle. All right, to Mark's earlier point about knowing your audience, let's figure out our audience here. Can you please raise your hand if you are a fan of Kansas City entrepreneurship? Excellent. Keep your hand up if you are a fan of Royals baseball. Ah, not bad. I got a lot of you here. Great. So the, you can put your hand down. The Kauffman Foundation celebrates entrepreneurship in Royals baseball every year with an event called E-Day at the K. This year, it is the evening of June 18th. Um, Kauffman Foundation has teamed up with Casey Sourcelink to throw an extra special celebratory tailgate beforehand to celebrate all things Kansas City entrepreneurship. So that starts at 4.30 on Monday, June 18th. It is totally free and you're all welcome. So come hang out. As a part of celebrating Kansas City entrepreneurship, Casey Sourcelink is doing some fun uh, awards for folks who work hard behind the scenes to make Kansas City entrepreneurship happen. Um, I'm excited to tell you that our very own Courtney Winholtz is up for an award and we need you to go vote for her. So please go to kcsourcelink.com backslash eday at the K and vote for Courtney Winholtz. You'll find her. Raise your hand if you're a fan of Courtney Winholtz. There we go. Please go vote before this Friday when voting closes and we will see you on Monday, June 18th for some baseball. Thanks guys. Thanks, Kyle. All right, up next, we've got Mug Club. Raise your hand if you've been here 10 times or more. All right, keep your hand up if you do not have a mug. Billy's coming to get you. Billy, where are you going? Thank you. All right. Yes. Tell us who you are, what you do, and why you're here. Wonderful. Good morning, my name is Deborah Goldstein. I am honored to work at the uh, National World War I Museum and Memorial. If you haven't been there, you must come. It's a phenomenal place. You learn a lot about history. And I'm really here uh, with my associate that I work with, uh, Debbie Bass, and we're here to learn and to know more about this. So it's, it's an exciting morning for us. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. coming. Thank you. All right, guys, are you ready for our next presenter? Sweet. All right, help me welcome Katie Hoke with Porchlight Plans. Please give her a warm round of applause.
right up here. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so good morning. I'm Katie Hoke with Porchlight Plans. Um, let's see, there we go. A uh, quick backstory on me, I grew up in the Wichita area and I earned my degree at K-State in interior architecture. Shortly after, I studied abroad in Copenhagen where I ended up meeting my husband, Jared Hoke, and then we moved to Seattle for about 12 years. Um, in Seattle, or in 2016, we decided we'd had enough of sort of the big city and moved back to Kansas, to Lawrence specifically, and with our business partner, opened an architecture and design firm called Hoke Clay. Um, throughout our career, our focus has been high-end custom residential design, and um, I always sort of ask the question, how could we take this level of service and this level of expertise and bring it back to people like me? Like, I can't afford to hire myself to design a house. Um, additionally, uh, I've taught at K-State as a professor of practice. So that leads us into how can we make custom residential design affordable, accessible, and sustainable? Um, it's interesting, full design service to build a custom home is about 10 to 15% of construction cost, and that's really not accessible for most of uh, new homeowners. Um, architects are also seen as not the most approachable of professions, you know, sort of the Frank Lloyd Wright model of my way or the highway. And then our business model, you know, really hasn't changed for the past 60 years. We have a lot of new technology, but the way we um, do business has not been updated. I learned early on in my career that single family homes actually pro pollute as much as our vehicles. This was shocking to me. And cars are rebuilt, you know, every five, 10 years you get a new car, but our homes should last for hundreds of years. So we strongly believe that all new homes should be built to very high energy standards. Um, a zero energy home initially might cost slightly more, five to 10%, but the lifetime cost is significant, immediately saving up to 50% in utility bills. And this is a proven model. Europe's been building zero energy homes and communities for years, and they've been very successful. So at Hoke we decided to create porch light plans, which brings sustainable um, personal house plans for healthier today and a greener tomorrow. But this is a website platform. It's taking a service and putting it more into a product. So on our website, we have pre-designed home plans. They're built to high sustainable standards. They're very affordable. Um, a custom home plan from Porchlight is about 1% of construction cost. And then the design is easy to customize. You can work with us, you can work with a builder or another architect to customize your plan. So on our website, you can preview and select your style of home and look at our floor plans. You can also learn more about the floor plans, download tear sheets, download resources in terms of budgeting and how to plan for your new home. And then with a couple easy clicks, you can purchase the home plans and after you pay, they're immediately downloaded to your computer. So we're really removing the barrier in the process to um, new home plan designs for our customers. So our target market, we're looking at um, customers in the mid-30s to early 70s. These are customers who are pretty established in their careers. Um, they have a bit of a higher household income of $100,000 to $150,000. They're generally in a professional service um, occupation. Um, they're passionate about shopping local, about buying goods that are handmade. They're active in the community. Um, they support the arts and they also love to have a healthy and active lifestyle. Most of our customers own their home with an average home value of around $300,000. And then our customers are a national, on the national scale. So they live in and around major metropolitan areas across the United States. It's not just focused on a local market. So who's our competition? This is not a new idea. This has been around since the Sears homes in the early 1900s. Um, there are a lot of websites out there doing a very similar business model. We found Perch Plans, which is a very similar to us. It's an architect who's offering pre-designed home plans. So this was great. They've had some success. We're happy to see this. But what we noticed and what we've heard from our clients is these plans are not easy to customize for their own family or for their building site. Um, a lot of websites do offer zero energy or passive house level plans. 
However, um, we would argue that the design is not really functional or enduring. And if it's going to be sustainable, we want it to be beautiful as well. And lastly, there's a lot of websites that just pretty much curate plants. They don't design, they just, they're a collection of plants. So here you can shop for 40,000 house plants, which sounds like a great Friday night to me. So how do we beat the competition? So in our practice, it has been our mission. We are a customer service firm. We happen to design, we happen to have a home at the end of it, but we are very dedicated on high level customer service. And we don't believe that one size fits all for our homes. It's not like an automobile where you can just buy a new one every five years. We believe that homes need to fit our users and the location that they're built. And then we're also passionate about a high level of sustainability. This should be something that's easy to apply to every single new home that's built in our country. So we want to make that accessible to the homeowners and to builders. Because we believe if a home is really going to be sustainable or building, it has to um, be beautiful and functional first, because these buildings should be around for hundreds of years. So where are we running into problems? Well, um, we're bootstrapping our effort. We're a small startup, we have a professional service firm, but we don't have a lot of capital to throw into marketing, to digital advertising, even into traditional advertising venues. And we're also waiting to build our first um, home. So one of the big one of the big comments we've had, big feedback has been, you know, if you had a built house, we lo we would love to go see it. And we do have a lot of built projects from our professional service end, but we haven't built one yet for Porchlight. So thank you very much. I would love to hear your ideas on our business, our products, and how we can um, increase our budget on a shoestring. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Love, <clears throat> love the design. Uh, love the natural light you guys bring into the into the uh, different designs you have. I just I'm a huge fan of that. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you generate business? So, um, what is your focus? Um, what channels do you go into, and and how do you, how do you create business? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently, we um, we sort of have three tiers. First is internet marketing through social media, through paid Google AdWords through boosting Facebook posts. Um, secondly, just traditional word of mouth. You know, it's amazing how calling up the boulder or calling up somebody who shares our passion, grabbing a coffee or a quick phone call, um, uh, and just, you know, that traditional method. And then the last one is we do participate um, in some print media locally in Lawrence. Um, but again, the, the media, it's just like crazy how expensive it is to advertise both digitally and in print media. You know, uh, w w getting ready for, for your presentation, I took a look at some of your different channels and, and the website. I think you, you made a comment about your mission and what, you're, what you kind of committed to and what your, what your goals are. I had a tough time seeing that on the site. Okay. And so I think there's an opportunity for you to really kind of establish your stake in the sand and really talk about what differentiates your, your firm versus those other ones you showed mm -hmm. and, and carve that niche, right? Because that's what people is going to drive people to you, right? Um, I also think um, highlighting the fact that you are not just curating plans, that you are the designers and you are a partner with this person in developing and building their house, right? I think those are, those are great uh, things that you could highlight that I think differentiate you. Oh, um, you. I think it's great that you also know your target market. That's uh, usually a biggest, the biggest challenge I see with a lot of startups is they don't really know who they're trying to sell to. Um, and therefore, they, their message and their, and their voice are all over the place. And so if you can cater your, uh, your message, your voice, uh, the things you talk about, relate to the people who are trying to buy your product, uh, and leverage that in your social channels, I think you'll be really successful. That's great feedback. Well, thank you, first of all, for sharing your, your business. It's, it's, a, it's a great one. It's an awesome idea. And you know, I guess my, my, one of my questions was, you talked about construction costs for design being 10 to 15 percent tradition on average, and you're more in the one percent range. How how are you doing that? Is it just is it okay? These are pre-designed plans. That's why you're able to do it. But it sounds like you're also able to customize as well. Mm -hmm. But how are you able to keep that so low? That's incredible. 
Well, that's a great Such question. a great selling point. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know if many of you have worked with an architect, but it's a full service. So depending on you know what you're asking for, if you came to us and said, well, I kind of want a house and I have this site and just go to town, you can imagine on our end, that's a lot of time, right? So we have to do a lot of interviewing. We have to go through a lot of iterations to figure out what this house might look like or even a building. Um, the way we're able to keep costs down with Porchlight is people, for instance, we just have a client who purchased the pavilion plan and they said, we love this plan, but we want to change the roof to be more of a farmhouse, which is great. And we want to add a bedroom and flip the garage. And so with those, with the starting point, we're not, we're not trying to redefine the home. We're just modifying what's there. Um, and it's also a limited service. So it's really um, appealing to the DIY crowd, people who said, I can go get my own permit, I can pick out my finishes, I can coordinate the details. Whereas in our full service firm, we're providing that service for them. So it's an abbreviated service. Great. And then I, I realize you're you know, in the starting process and you don't, don't quite have that first home yet. Once you get that one and you get going, um, are there plans, you know, down the road, way down the road for to get in the commercial sector at all? So many companies and businesses today are getting into the, you know, lead development and sustainability. Uh, it's such a big part of their business model um, and their finances because they're, they're saving money on energy costs. Any plans down the road to explore that in the commercial sector? Or? Yeah, so currently in, the, in, our, in our architecture firm, we do provide... Um, lead and sustainable services for commercial projects. And again, those are kind of more of a traditional model. So I think that's a great question. How could we take the similar pre-design and add it to a commercial? You know, maybe it's designing um, commercial buildings that could have a number of different retail um, components to it. So that's, that's really something we should have on our radar. We're going to go ahead and open it up to audience questions. I'm going to start it off over here on your left. I like you and your business, and I'm here to learn from you this morning. And I'm agreeing with you that you need built homes, it would seem, for this business model to work. So I have a question for you in your presentation. You, you had a slide with a map, and you said you've, I think you said you've sold these designs to city across the, across the country. Did I understand that correctly? Oh, no, sorry. So that is just identifying our target audience and where they live. So that we know that our, <clears throat> our home buyers are going to live near these major cities across the country. Okay, so because I was, you've sold some designs, but the homes haven't been built yet. Correct. Would you mind sharing with us how many designs have been sold yeah, compared so to that zero that has been built? <laughs> yeah, so we've sold um, one design, and then we have another one uh, that should close, you know, this summer sometime. And, and wh where my question is, what I will learn from you is you, you need the home to be built. You're obviously selling the design. You don't have control over what happens after the design has been sold. Sure. What are you learning or what are you trying to learn in terms of until that piece works, until the home actually gets built, your business model kind of gets stuck. So what are you learning in terms of how long that takes? How can you make that more likely? What are you looking at? I want to. I, that's what I want to learn from you today. Yeah, and I think that's something. That's kind of a question in our mind. Um, we are also working with a local developer in Lawrence to, with on four homes that I think we will end up marketing through Porchlight so that we can sort of fulfill that built model. Um, but you're right. We can't control the end product. In our professional firm, we can. We're involved from A to Z. But in this one, it's a bit of a wild card. Uh, so when it is built, we will take very strategic photos, right? So we will document what is successful. And then I think the client testimonial will be really powerful because we're, we're really dedicated to the client services and helping them through the process. So I think we have a lot to learn. There's some unknowns out there. And in the middle. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for your presentation. This is a brilliant idea, and I think it's one that my wife and I could use. Thank you. Um, I think when, when we downsize, we're going to downsize into something like this. But I remember, I guess we haven't researched it yet. So I'm just curious, are you expecting one to actually get built? Or are you going to build one yourself? Is, do you know somebody's going to build one? Or is it still so far out in the future that you can't tell? Um, I would love to build one ourselves. We um, ended up, that was our original plan, but the neighborhood we moved into in Lawrence is just so awesome. We, <laughs> we don't want to move. So 
Um, we are, we would love to have, you know, we're really looking for somebody in the Midwest area that we could visit um, yeah. to build a home. But again, we're working with a developer in Lawrence who has four um, new home lots that will put a porch light plan on as well. So when we bought our fixer upper, my wife did exactly this at ours. Uh, her brother did a sustainable home in the St. Louis area and I mean, very much like what you've described. And I think it, it's such a viable idea. I, I hope that you find some traction somewhere and, and find your market so that somebody will actually build one because this is really worth doing. Great, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you. Got another question for you in the center. So I love that you do know your target market. You didn't just say, our market is, hey, do you live in a house? Because I feel like a lot of people do that. They just assume that that's their market. How did you determine your persona? Like, what tools did you use? Did you use a firm? Because you even know that they like donating to the arts. I totally believe this. I see this person. How did you determine that? Um, well, first of all, we've been in the industry for over 20 years. So, and this is what we do. This is our bread and butter. So we know the clients really well. Um, and we know the type of clients. And unfortunately, this client that we're appealing to is the client that we usually turn down and say, we'd love to help you. Here's what we can do for your budget, but we can't do a whole custom home. We can't build you the homes they showed in the beginning, which are 20 plus million dollar estates. Um, so we, we know our clients very well. Um, secondly, we used um, tools online, um, just reading through Generation X. And then I'm going to forget the name. Um, there's a... a like you go through and you can identify different demographics, like there's an Emerald City, and is it Ezra? Is anyone familiar with that? It's, anyway, so we just did, we did a lot of research understanding, you know, what type of customer is looking for something that's sustainable, um, looking for, you know, they're usually more involved in the community, they're more active, they're more vocal about what they believe in. I have a question in the back. Good morning, love the presentation. My name is Bob King. I come here and I look for win-win situations and I recall like organizations that are building small homes for veterans and there was a documentary a couple years ago about you know East of Truce and there's a lot of homes that are in, in disrepair there and it's, it's gonna cost too much to tear them down. Could there be ways where you could maybe satisfy those needs, take elements of your designs and put them into like a small home for veterans or improve one of those homes on Truce, get some money from the city to do it and then you'd be able to highlight some of the features of your program? Yeah, definitely, that's a great question. So we did uh, recently just, um, we're a finalist in a competition for a tiny house for veterans out of Lincoln. Um, so we're excited about that. And one thing, we don't personally build. So rehabbing homes would be something that would be out of our scope of work, but providing small home plans for a builder is something we are really, really interested in, especially affordable housing, low income housing, all of that, we are very open to those relationships as well. Got a question for you in the front. I had a question about your sheds. Um, how, what is the square footage on the little sheds you had? Was that a thousand dollars for that design? Yeah, yeah. so those um, are anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. <clears throat> and then we do have a two, two bedroom, those are a three bedroom, two bath model. And we do have a two bedroom model, which is great for downsizing that's closer to um, 1,200 square feet. Okay, and then so if we as a nonprofit were to say we would like to get a design for you, for just buildings for, for our nonprofit. How long would that take for you to find the builder and from start to finish? Um, so on our end, the design can be achieved very quickly within a few weeks. Um, we use a computer program that just makes our work very efficient. Um, partnering with a builder would just take more time to find a relationship with a builder who's interested in, in that process. But one um, building technology that we believe is really great to take advantage of is called SIPs, or structural insulated panels. And it's basically like building a gingerbread house. These panels come out pre-insulated, they're structural, they can frame a home in about three days, and a smaller home even faster. And so start to finish, I think you could, you know, design, if you had a builder right on board, ready to go, and build a home within maybe three to four months and have somebody move in. I have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, question in the front. Hi, uh, I noticed that you're based in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, which is kind of interesting because if I recall correctly, Lawrence is going through like an affordable uh, housing crisis at the moment. Uh -huh. um, and maybe this is not particularly germane to what you're presenting, but I was wondering if you can share your expertise anyways. Um, so what would it be like, what would the challenges be of taking a plan like yours and implementing it to so it could be more affordable 
uh, for people who are going through those problems? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, on our end, it's quite easy. You know, if somebody says we need a 900 square foot house and it needs these requirements, we are happy to provide that. It's a very easy um, change on our end. Where we find it's really difficult is actually at the city level. So what Lawrence is experiencing is um, growth and they're unwilling to make the city more dense. So they don't want to have smaller lots, they don't want to have two homes or townhomes on the inner, lot, the inner city lots. And that's something we would love to be involved with is to talk to the city. We watched this happen in Seattle and in Portland go through the same kind of growing pains of we have more people but we don't have any more land. How do we add density that's affordable to our city? Got a question for you in the center. My question is kind of also on the affordability aspect that, you know, really you're selling the plan, but how do you really help your customers understand that, you know, net zero design isn't just about how you lay out the house, it's obviously about the materials as well. So how do you help them wrap their brains around the final cost? I mean, obviously furnishings make a difference, whether they're choosing just a regular countertop versus like a ripple glass, recycled glass one. How do you really help them see how much this final house is gonna cost? Right, that's a great question. And so our approach is the same as it is with all of our clients. Um, we can provide the designs, but we don't control building costs. Um, that's up to the builder. So what we offer is to speak with their builder if they have an existing relationship. We have, it's all about asking the right questions with the builder, and a lot of times homeowners just don't know what they don't know. So we're always happy on a consultation level to have a meeting with their builder um, we love to see builders that produce uh, spreadsheets for their costs. So we say, Let, show us what this is going to cost. Why is it going to cost so much? So it's providing a service to the client so they can understand what their final product will cost. We have a question in the back. Um, my question is about customizability versus functionality, especially when it comes to aesthetic pieces of a house. Uh, they can really affect how well the house functions in terms of heating, cooling, maybe air tightness of the roof. How do you deal with uh, customers wanting an aesthetic piece that maybe not, might not function for their house? How do you uh, inform them and uh, make a decision between the customer's right and making the house work as best as possible? Yeah, well, our first, the first thing we say is, is always it's their house, right? So it's their choice what they'd like to do. And hopefully they're coming to us for a level of expertise. And so if, if a customer is asking for something that's you know, very custom and unique and might affect the performance of the home, what we do is we really listen to their needs and we try to understand what their goal is in you know, adding this really unique custom piece. And usually we've been really successful working through the conversation of, well, we can still achieve these goals, but we can also achieve the beauty of the home you're looking for and um, the sustainability factor. And you know, just by continuing to educate them and listening very carefully and having great conversations, um, we've been successful in our practice in overachieving those hurdles. All right, last question. What can we as a community do for you? So it's a little bit redundant sort of to what um, the presentation was on, but um, we, are, we would love to make more contacts with local builders and developers. Um, developers especially really shape the face of our communities, and a lot of times the bottom line is you know, all about money, and we're, we're looking for de developers that share the same passion that we do, affordability, sustainability, and working closely to provide a high level of client services. Um, and then, you know, if you know somebody who wants to build a home, they want some of it customized, they're really interested in being more sustainable, like not paying the energy company more money, I would love to not pay Westar as much money as we do. Um, we would love to work with them to build their first house. We can help them through the entire process, with, you know, introducing contractors, even permitting we can do remotely. So if you know somebody that's interested in building a home in the near future, regardless of the size, um, have, we'd love to reach out to them as well. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Much. Let's give her a hand. All right. Well, thank you, folks, for coming out. Um, I want to point out one more time the caffeinators. Uh, these are men and women who volunteer their time and their talents to kind of help you traverse this thing called One Million Cups. Uh, professionals just like yourself. Would you guys stand up? Stand up. Put your hands up. Okay. There you go. Thank you, guys. Feel free to address them before or after a meeting, especially if the line gets too long over here. 
and they'll help you out. And uh, show up next week, please, for Nova Q and Alice Analytics. Thank you. <laughs>